we have seen markets a little bit more focused on the positive data points last week. Are we just overlooking the potential for stagflation to materialize? Well, I don't think markets have necessarily ignored the situation. I think it's still an ongoing concern and it moves from data point to data point. I mean, I think what we've seen over the last couple of days is that sentiment um, really got quite bearish. Um, we saw really um, investors are becoming, you know, probably as negative on stocks as they've been, at least since the US election last year, you know, perhaps, you know, any time before the pandemic where everyone was worried about, you know, where valuations were and where growth was in the context of uh, monetary policy tightening and, of course, uh, these inflation pressures that could potentially drive it. Um, but there's a short-term factor at the moment where the markets are feeling, you know, reasonably emboldened by the fact that we're probably going to see some re reasonably, reasonably robust results from US corporates just this quarter. It's really strong from a narrative point of view for, for um, market participants to buy back into stocks and buy that dip. Uh, but the longer term issue remains what's happening with, with um, you know, global, the global supply shock um, brought, upon, brought upon by the pandemic, the inflation pressures that, that, that's coming about from that, um, and the very uh, fine line that the Fed is walking to try and uh, tamp down these inflation risks, while at the same time not uh, stepping on the recovery or you know, uh, undermining financial market strength. Can consumers lead... Uh a market recovery or a market surge that could be sustained when we have seen so much money stashed away during the pandemic but not necessarily being spent. We are seeing this function on the Bloomberg ECSU Go that shows surprises in eco data. And yeah, we're doing pretty well on personal and household spending. But I wonder if this can be sustained because they are not really necessarily opening up their wallets as of yet. When can we see that change? I think it's a slow burn and I think it's something that we see consumers uh, over time eat into those savings um, and that'll continue to sustain the recovery going forward. But I mean, I think this isn't a demand side question at the moment for, for market participants. It's a supply side one. Um, and we know that consumers are reasonably strong uh, or in a re reasonably strong position because of all the stimulus that have been provided for them uh, since the start of the pandemic. We know the US labour market is improving. In fact, people are feeling even reluctant to go back into, into work. People are feeling very, very wealthy because their, their house, house values are going up and their share portfolios are, are going up as well. Um, and there are all these other indications that, you know, on the demand side, things are reasonably solid. There might even be more stimulus coming along from the US government uh, that could sustain that dynamic. Uh, what's really concerning is that over time, we could see productivity across the global economy diminish as these supply side issues really crimp um, the productive capacity of, of businesses and eventually slow down their ability to be able to um, uh, hire, create jobs, uh, and then in the longer term, su sustain that demand. Of course, too, there's that issue of price rises and that potentially uh, being a, a factor in crimping consumption going forward, too, as well as, you know, obviously being something that, um, you know, re uh, cause a reassessment of, of the uh, um, policy outlook going forward as well. So for me, demand's very strong. It's going to be a slow burn as consumers uh, run down their savings and also continue to enjoy a robust labour market. But we're continuing to hit this ceiling because of the fact that, you know, we have these supply side disruptions and it's keeping the global economy, um, you know, not working yet at full capacity. And that's, I think, the longer term risk. The supply side will be in focus with the China data dump today as well, Carl. I want to throw up this preview when it comes to the GDP. But, you know, lifting under the hood, we know that the, the retail sentiment aspect, that the Chinese consumer is underperforming. We know that there's the, the kind of multiple confluence of crises, be it Evergrande and the energy uh, and inflation crisis there as well. So what are your expectations from China? And is that sort of diminishing expectation of growth from China something that the markets are not really worried about, but perhaps should be more worried about ongoing? They'll be more worried about as it um, as time goes on. I think what we're seeing at the moment that, you know, almost China's tending to rely on, on old and tried methods to continue to sustain its growth. And we've seen that out in trade numbers recently where the imports were very weak, consumer demand has been rather weak. Um, but at the same time, we've obviously got a global economy or at least developed economies that um, can't get enough of Chinese goods still and demand is very, very strong there. Um, we're seeing their ex exports quite, quite strong as well. Um, so that's sustaining things in the short term. But obviously, you know, the really big thing at the moment with, with China is the structural shifts that we're probably going to see come underway over the next um, months and years as they try and re, uh, restructure their economy, um, 
obviously try and contain the issues as it relates to their property market and obviously deleverage their financial sector and property sector too, which will have two effects, of course, which is the major driver of, of some of their growth, which is construction activity and industrial activity may take a hit uh, because of the slowdown in, in the property market. And of course, the wealth effects that that will continue to have on consumers going forward, um, causing something of a vicious cycle for their economy. So I think that's a really big red flag for, for global demand. Again, talking more about the demand side of things, is that China's economy looks like, mm -hmm. like it's going to be slowing down. China's policymakers aren't prioritising growth at the moment. They're prioritise, prior, prioritising social issues. Uh, and that's a problem for the, for the, um, for the future of market. So does that mean, in terms of the domestic Australian market, that the reopening trade is more of a focus at this point? Uh, it's much more of a focus. I mean, I think still, you know, we're, we're obviously um, benefiting a lot from pretty strong terms of trade. You know, we've spoken about the iron ore price being, you know, well off its highs, but it's still, historically speaking, quite elevated at what is it, $130 uh, per tonne at the moment. So we're still seeing that export-driven growth. Um, but domestically, it's definitely about trying to take the benefits of that pent-up demand that's probably built up over the last couple of quarters um, with um, New South Wales and, and Victoria being in lockdown. Uh, it's similar to that situation. It's probably going to be something of a slow burn for the Australian economy. We had a very V-shaped um, reopening because we were basically at COVID zero for the better part of six months um, last year. That meant that we were pretty much free to, to roam around and, and be economic agents as, as we would in normal circumstances. This is probably going to be a slower grind. We're going to have virus in the community like we've seen in other parts of the world. People are reluctant to behave the same way that they did when the virus is quite endemic. So the reopening trade will sustain the Australian uh, recovery. It'll probably be a flatter recovery from here than what we experienced say, last year.